design, first of all, is very lonely. It's, it's a lonely profession. And when we find people in our networks that we can talk to, and I've had the luxury of, uh, specifically with Grant and, and Chris Paparone over the past six years, I've had people that I could email and, and talk to and write with and exchange these ideas uh, when normally there's just no one else. So it's very lonely. Design is also dangerous. So Michel Foucault offers that the problematizer, uh, who I, I would say philosopher might be a, a nice word to translate to, the philosopher faces a great risk that many others do not when the, when the king brings the philosopher to them. Not only can the king kill them, as he would a general or a court jester, because they don't entertain him or they don't win victories, uh, but the philosopher has another unique death that Foucault warns about, and that is you may tell the king what they need to know, that new knowledge, that new perspective, but if they are not ready or you are not persuasive, they will kill you for it. And I think in terms of our organizations, this is why design is dangerous for all of us. Uh, design is, is changing. I see it as changing. Disruptive is another great term, too, and I, I think they kind of work together. And then I would also offer that design has no real form. And there are useful models. There are useful constructs, heuristic aids, trucks. But design itself cannot be tied to a certain structural form. And even if it does, it's only temporary to the context. And the next emergent state will demand design in a new form. And if we force what previously worked, we fall back into the same trap of all of our doctrine, all of our processes. And then lastly, this is, I think, the piece for all of us here. Everyone here is doing this, but it's not occurring as much in other locations. And that is constant sense-making, constant self-improvement, constant awareness that you never get to the top of the design mountain. You never get to a position where you are the master and that you can have a series of pupils. And I think that design really is, is about the potential that you may have gone off in a, in a direction that no longer is valid and you don't even realize it, and that one of those pupils actually is seeing a different way that is profoundly important. But if the old system still maintains, then that will never manifest because we have our, our set roles. And so that's what I see as the dominant system or us, sometimes maybe the rival, are all the things working against these design observations. So while it's lonely to be a designer, it's because we tend to get ostracized. When you are tra talking about radical innovation in different perspectives, you are a minority. And typically in dominant organizations, the minorities are eliminated. And in, and in many instances, the, the bell curve is sought and the outliers are what? They're eliminated. That's the other part with the dangerous uh, aspect in that designers have a very dangerous lifestyle. And I can tell you that many of you probably have experienced with me where if you, you walk a fine line and if you promote something that is too radical to the organization, you may, you may find yourself in, in quite a bit of trouble. The, the changing aspect has to do with the system is trying to retain control. It's trying to retain that ability to predict the reduction of uncertainty, particularly in the military. And so innovation occurs as a military historian Barry Posen offers, only when we are defeated or when outside pressures demand it, politics or our populations, or if we're expanding. And I think that's an interesting no notion is that expansion is occurring now. The growth of design in Colombia, uh, in Poland, in Sa even Saudi Arabia has expressed interest in design, in the Netherlands, uh, in Australia, uh, all these different islands of design thinking are coming up. And, and so that expansion is, is quite amazing. Uh, the, the form thing, the opposite, the antithesis, would be that there's a desire to indoctrinate design and to create publications and structures and sequences and checklists because it's the, the shackling it to a form of which it is, it is not able to do. Um, and then lastly, uh, Baud Rillard, one of, one of you know, my favorite postmodern writers, talks about an old master way of explication or teaching, 
And, and I see this as really what we do traditionally in a lot of our military processes, and I have a slide on that later. And so design becomes the antithesis of that, where we are really nomads. And, and Shimon Nabi is a great example, is that he, he really didn't mentor and teach me directly. Uh, at the point when I was at Sam's, he was kind of blacklisted, and we had to meet him uh, in, in secret rendezvous. And when I met with him initially, he just rambled a whole bunch of different books and concepts and yelled at Alice that you know we weren't reading the right things. And so I remember writing them all down, and then I tried to read some of his articles, and I could not understand them. And so I took all of his footnotes, all of the books he said to read, and I went and I read as all of them. And, and I continued to read and read and read. And over time, the next time I met with him in a coffee shop, Al set it up, we were able to actually have a design conversation. And for me, I was the nomad that was following the breadcrumbs, but also finding my own paths. And so I feel that, you know, that that's really the essence of design is that he didn't have to teach me so that I could figure out ways, but he threw the concepts out there and some people are able to kind of work with it and some, some don't want to or unable to or unwilling. Uh, so I consider myself very lucky. Uh, and I also think that that's the way to design might actually end up being taught in general is that we, we can't have structured classrooms. We can't have syllabus and expect to pop out at the ends a bunch of Picassos because really you get a Picasso and then the next Picasso to pop up might come from somewhere entirely different. Um, so what you see in the slide here is just a depiction of what I'm trying to work with now where I am in, in my design journey uh, six years later. So I took Deleuze and Gattieri some of their concepts on what is art and what is science and how philosophy for them uh, moves between them. So there's always a philosophy of art and then there's a philosophy of science. Uh, and the military applications here is that we do have a military art and we do have a, a military science. Uh, but I think that design works, I don't like using the term anymore as bridge because it's too engineering based and it brings us right back into the problems we have that we over engineer everything uh, the Taylorism impact upon the military in management is overwhelming. And so even the metaphors that we use, if we use bridge, it, it, it doesn't work anymore for me. We would, we would use the construction of reality. The construction of reality, exactly. <laughs> and so it, it becomes a, I see this as, a, as design is the process. It's, it's, it's the verb of working and understanding how science and military art and philosophy, not just one philosophy, not just Clausewitz, which is why I love that image of him kind of being blown away, uh, but, but other philosophies, rival philosophies, alternative philosophies, and how they impact interpreting and, and recognizing science and art. So what is possible in human expression? And so the, the words here, you know, we should all be familiar with all this, the analysis, the metrics, the quantification, uh, the objectivity of, of science. And then over here is all the things that when I find in my military professional education in you know, 22 years going is that we really, we really don't do this. Uh, and I'm an art major, so I look for it <laughs> at the basic course and basic training and, and everywhere else. And it, it wasn't there. There's a little bit of military art, and it's almost like they want to get through those slides so they can talk more about the stuff we really like to do. So empathy, creativity, expression, innovation, change, risk, these things are shackled over to this. So risk becomes something we want to mitigate, not explore. Innovation is something that only occurs in a controlled way, not in an unbounded way that, that threatens uh, cherished uh, institutional values. Is this the clicker? No, this is the report. Oh. Can you go to the, yes, thank you. So here's another model that I, I enjoy using. So on the sociolo sociological side, and, and Dr. Paparone really influenced me strongly here early on. Uh, Burrell and Morgan in the 70s uh, came up with several models on the social construction of reality and, and the structures of paradigms. And so for me, I moved from my Sam's experience with Alice and Shimon, which was very heavy on the postmodern philosophy side, but also Alex Ryan, when I go down to his office and talk to him, it was on the complexity theory side in, in a bit of that there was a great balance between those. And then with Dr. Paparone, he really influ influenced me with sociology. And so I see that all of those become disciplines that intertwine and help me try to make sense uh, of this design process. 
And so for, for this, this is just a model, but I happen to use this quite a bit. And the tensions that they use uh, at the top one, objectivity, subjectivity, uh, should be pretty easy to grasp. Most of us are familiar. This is that highly objective, everything's tangible, the universe can, once we determine gravity, gravitational theory can be applied to any star that we observe with a telescope. It could be millions of light years away, uh, but it's, it's going to work reliably. On the subjectivity side, this is where, with my students, I talk about Mona Lisa. Everyone can tell us, on the objective side, the value of Mona Lisa, the number of people that have visited, the size of it, the colors of the palette scheme, when it was painted, the weight of the frame, and all those different things. But they can't tell us, why is it considered the most beautiful, famous painting in the world? Why? And, and as an art guy, I don't know. And, and when I walked to see it at the Louvre and I saw all these other greater paintings that I like better, I go, why is there so much attention to this little itty bitty painting that's really not that better or different than any of others? But there's a million tourists fighting to get to this painting, to get their picture, and they bypass all the other paintings along the way. And then everyone runs to the Venus statue to get their picture there. And they ignore all the other statues. Why? That's on that subjective side that we're not really good at. So. The second tension, though, is the one that I have the hardest time getting students to understand in our design courses. And, and this is the difference between a constant low change reality and a radical high change. And so they say, oh, well, that's easy. If I drop this, then that's change. Uh, no, that's not really it. it the, the radical change versus a constant, I like to use Michel Foucault as an example. And in uh, Discipline and Punish, you know, if you're familiar with that work, he talks about how uh, previously, we would, we would punish uh, publicly uh, our, our criminals in stockades, public executions, burning them at the stake. It was a very sensual, uh, emotive uh, application from the state or the, the society upon individuals that behaved in a way that conflicted with the rules of the time. But over time, Foucault argues that the penal system and rehabilitation has changed dramatically. And we now put all this behind closed doors. There's a focus on the institutionalization of reform. When a prisoner is executed now, it's not done publicly. It's actually very hard to see an execution. You have to be invited. It's very uh, humane. Uh, and it's, it's done very differently. So that represents high change and that your society changes. Next slide. So for me, at least, this model that Borella Morgan made in, in the 70s uh, provides quite a bit of framework for looking at uh, and challenging our students to say, well, what is your paradigm? How do you see the world? What is your rationale? And what other rationals are out there for other rivals for you to consider? And so here in the corner is functionalism. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of other terms that apply to this. You know, you've heard positivism. Uh, Newtonian style, uh, 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 reductionism, and other different concepts are kind of loosely related to functionalism. But this process is an intersection between uh, a, a very objective ontology on how the world works and a very low change stable. And, and so that's where a lot of our doctrine, a lot of our processes work very well. I think the military decision making process or, or the joint operational planning process, all the different structures want a world and work in a world that is much like this. On, on, the, uh, on the high side, radical structuralism, that I would argue that this is probably where Marxism works best, in that from a Marxist perspective, you still have your objective world, but you have your change. The workers of the world will unite, and there will be a great climatic battle, or you know, eschatologically, there will be a final fight. And it will be the workers defeating capitalism, and we'll live in a uh, communist or a, a socialist uh, Marxist utopia. So that's your high change over here. I think that also elements like the Daesh and other radical uh, uh, ideological uh, extremist organizations might operate to there to some degree. Uh, a divine end of the world Armageddon approach. And so with that, we challenge our students that, well, if we're only thinking about the Islamic State down here is one of us that we can apply all of our models to and rational behavior, but they really might be in a different paradigm, then fundamentally we are completely flawed from the very beginning of our planning processes. The one that I want to spend more time on though is radical humanism. 
And I think this is where postmodernism, which is the main topic I have today, really operates largely. So postmodernism takes a highly subjective reality that's in a state of flux and change. And for my students, I use a lot of pop culture and media examples. We show them uh, clips of Fight Club and The Matrix, Alice in Wonderland, and these all, for me, have a lot of postmodern applications. And it connects with the younger students so that they say, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. When Neo's in The Matrix, yeah, and Asian Smith. So, but the radical humanism, in terms of the relationships here, this is why I think this model has value for me. And that is, when you have this quadrant chart, each paradigm shares with two neighbors some similarity, some overlap, or as uh, a, a variety of sociologists, such as uh, uh, Hatch and Tukas and uh, uh, Pitri and Giora, say that there's interplay. And there's, uh, there's, there's incommensurability, of course, that the paradigms don't want to play together. But there's also overlap and interplay, except for here and here. So the one that we're talking about is functionalism and radical humanism, or postmodernism in the way our militaries want the world to be. And I think this is why, for postmodernism, it is so hard to insert this into what we do, including in design, is because of this diametric opposition at the ontological level, the epistemological level, and because of that, all of our methods are geared towards completely different processes. And so if you try to bring postmodernism openly, you will be ostracized, eliminated, shackled, and the old masters will tell you that you are a fool. Next slide, please. So where I am right now with, with what I'm doing and, and what I'm researching, uh, there's a demand in our military at the leadership level for essentially exactly what the Israelis are doing, what Shimon is doing, for the IDF, and that is, how do our leaders blend design thinking, which is operating very differently, with the traditional linear processes that we, we are always going to do? There will always be a detailed campaign plan. Unfortunately, that, that's, that's not going away for a long time. There will always be tactical applications and timesheets and matrices, because we do live in a tangible world. Um, where we're conquering land or air or sea or dominating terrains, physical terrains, uh, has to be done in some form. But the question becomes, all right, well, how do you do that? How, how do you, as a military leader, oscillate between doing this design process and doing this detailed planning process, working in functionalism and working in other paradigms to include radical humanism? And what I offer is that if we try to apply simplistic doctrine and try to shackle design down to sequences and checklists in, in one language, one process. We end up just consuming design. Planning will eat design. And instead, if we look at it through different processes here, this graphic shows convergence and divergence, just as two useful terms that I use. The convergence process is where you have a, you have a, a large organization or a herd of cats and the military does what they need to do to move them into a very uh, unified, uh, low-risk, predictable, um, low-uncertainty force that can do processes repetitively across various parts of the world reliably, right? And, and that makes sense. So an infantry platoon can enter and clear a room in a mud hut in Afghanistan or in Charlie Sheen's penthouse apartment in downtown Los Angeles very effectively. It, it'll be a different room with different structures, but they just have to modify a little bit tactically to be able to do those processes. So that's an aspect of convergence. And I think this is where, in terms of creativity, our organizations, our military, rewards convergent creativity. So an example of that is if a, if a field grade officer in Afghanistan comes up with a, a unique way to synchronize Helicopter air assaults by having a combination of some offset and some directly on the target, which would increase your zone of disruption uh, when you're doing your raids. That's a very effective way of creatively converging your organization to be more effective. And so that creativity is rewarded by our organizations. But there are different types of creativity that are not rewarded because they're not geared towards convergence. The top part of this pyramid 
is expanding out. And I think this becomes really the essence of what the design process is. It's about moving from an organization that is about increasing uniformity in simplistic and comp comp complicated environments. And when we acknowledge we are in a complex or a chaotic environment, we need to have more options. We need to be able to innovate. And so how do we innovate if our organization is tailored towards all gaining convergence and moving towards convergent creativity? We, we simply can't. And so much of this is beyond our even our awareness because it becomes implicit. And so the design processes for me is about moving design teams in an inquiry towards divergent thinking. And the, the, the challenge of divergent thinking is that it's dangerous. It's high risk. And we've, uh, we've invited uh, one, one speaker recently to the gray zone. It was uh, Dr. Ken Stanley. Uh, from from uh, uh, one of the universities down in Florida, and he made a tremendous. And the reason we invited him is because Paul gave me his book the last time I was here. And Dr. Stanley and his partner work in artificial intelligence. It's a field that you would say has nothing to do with any of this, but it's profoundly important. What he what they realized, which was robots trying to be trained to navigate hallways on the what. At the time, said, they said this is the way to do computer programming to learn. And the robots were failing 70% uh, of the time or some statistic like that. They were failing quite a bit. And so they just said, all right, let's program the robots just to do something different each time, that they can't do the same thing they've done in the past. In other words, be entirely divergent. Those robots were able to make it through the maze at some 90% plus ratio. Profoundly better than the other way of doing it. But this was a radical, divergent way with high risk. And so with high risk, you have, if you do divergent, you'll have design teams come up with 15 different concepts, and 14 of them could be dead ends or failures. And what Dr. Ken Stanley offers is that those failures are not dead ends. They are actually stepping stones towards something that's emergent, something that's disruptive and innovative, and that actually stepping on what seems to be failure and more failure and more failure will actually move you towards an extremely rich, divergent option that provides you that a new advantage that your rivals don't have because they aren't doing that. They are doing the convergence only. But I think this is so hard for our military to really grasp because at a fundamental level, we don't want to do this we're very good at this, and we want innovation to work this way, too. We want creativity to be something that works this way. <coughs> the process is diametric in many ways. And so how does a leader do that? Can you go to the next slide? And what I offer, and I have a, a draft article that's right now with the Special Operations Journal uh, pending uh, their spring issue. And if you're interested in seeing a copy, I'd be very willing to share it with you. This is just a, a way of kind of showing, well, all right, the, a special, and it doesn't mean, need to necessarily be special operations, it's, it's any, any military leader. The convergent linear process is something that's much more familiar. And so this cycle goes that there's the planning process, and you notice the arrow comes back into the brain, that's, that's that feedback loop from action. They're receiving information, they're receiving observations, they're reflecting, but they're, they're thinking about their sense making in a convergent way, which is not bad. It's not bad at all, but it can't be done exclusively. If it's done exclusively, then you lose out on the whole left side, the blue circle. And so this, this looks like a single loop, but if you're familiar with triple loop learning, this is part of that, that iterative process. And so the convergent process, the commander continues with all the established traditions and processes that exist already. And so that, my article doesn't really deal with that, because I already know most all the readers are, are very well grounded in that. My article talks about this process, that divergent iterative, that design process. And so with that design inquiry, I use uh, one concept from uh, Carl Weick, sociologist, writes about flux and hunches. And I think most of those concepts correlate beautifully into postmodern concepts, design concepts. So in flux, we are, in, we are nomads and we are, we are drifting. And so when you're in flux, you're not tied to a form. You are moving around and experimenting. You're being divergent. 
And so you want to return to the flux in design over and over, never tying yourself to a certain process or structure because doing it too early is exactly in that Z formation that you're now going to shackle yourself to something wrong so that then your strategic and operational outputs are flawed and the what ifs will, will destroy you. And so instead you come up with hunches. And all hunches is, according to Weick, it's having an indication that there's a process that we haven't yet understood and cannot articulate. Or as, as Chris Paparone's favorite Scrabble word is, onomasiologically, which I, I like to use the term, uh, the, the definition of pornography by our United States Supreme Court, which is I'll know it when I see it. So onomasiological means, if, correct me if I'm wrong here, that there's, there's this concept and we just, we can't articulate it, but we know we know what we know about it. And we're just trying to struggle to do that. In some ways, design is an onomasiological struggle for the army, for the military. So in this process of, of flux and hunches, that is that, what I see is that drift. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that maybe in the next version of this. And so that drift process here is so different for that leader. And so the design leader has to recognize the difference here so that when they walk, he or she walks into a design inquiry, that they don't apply processes from the convergent linear planning, that they are in a different environment, a different way of thinking, and that their design inquiry can produce new processes through hunch and flux, flux and hunch, or drift. And so then in that leader's brain, there's the probability of stepping stones towards innovation, setting those conditions. It doesn't mean that doing design will get you innovation. It's not a, a magic uh, silver bullet, if you will. But if, if that leader sets those conditions by creating the right environment, picking the right people, creating the right cognitive freedoms, and then using the right language or lack thereof so that they can invent new language as needed, then that process there feeds into that design output. And so for, for our organizations, that design output then is articulated coming out through the mouth as the initial refined planning guidance, which then drives that convergence style linear planning process. But the cycle continues. And so that feedback from action should feed right back into the design. And I think this right now for some parts of our military organizations is a misunderstanding that we do design and then we're done. And then we do our planning and then we do our after action reviews and then we do what we like to call a hot wash and then we're good. And now we can start over again, new mission, okay, give me my guidance, we're gonna do design, okay, we're done with design now, stop, and now we're gonna do the planning. I would propose that both processes have to go simultaneously, interacting. And this is so sophisticated, so elegant, that it threatens what our military wants to see itself as and how it wants to see how it does the actions that manifest as its relevance. And so there's the rejection of this process because it takes work, it's hard. And, and so there is an element of uh, intellectual hostility to some of these concepts and going back to the paradigm model, if functionalism is our dominant paradigm but we are unaware, we will reject postmodern concepts because they are alien, they are threatening, they are dissimilar. 